Okay, good morning. It is a beautiful day here in Middle Tennessee. And we are going to continue with Let the Circle Be Unbroken. And this will be Chapter 3, Part B. So here we go. Mr. Justice Overton was called, and Melvin Sims recalled. Then Mr. Jameson made his summation, pleading to the jury to be merciful and reminding them that a verdict of guilty with no recommendation for clemency would result in the death penalty. You've heard the testimonies of all the witnesses involved, he said. You've heard Mrs. Barnett admit her doubt that T.J. was the one person who struck her husband, thereby killing him. You have heard T.J.'s account of what happened. You have heard him tell you that his accomplices that night were not black, as Mr. Maccabee contends, but R.W. and Melvin Sims. You have heard as well from both R.W. and Melvin Sims that they had spent considerable time with T.J. and that they were with him that night. You have heard from Reverend Gabson that he heard the Simpsons tell T.J. to come into Strawberry with them the night of the murder to get the pearl-handled gun. And you have heard the testimony of Mr. Justice Overton that he saw the Simpsons' truck parked in back of the mercantile an hour before R.W. and Melvin Sims said they were in town. Mr. Jameson walked the length of the jury box looking at each juror in turn. T.J. Avery has confessed to what he has done, but I ask each of you what really is his crime. He followed two white men blindly. They told him to break into the mercantile, and he did as he was told. Now whose fault is that? Haven't we always demanded that Negroes do as they are told? Have we always demanded their obedience? He waited as if for an answer before going on. If we teach them to follow us in what we deem is good, isn't it logical that they should follow our leading to what is not good? We demand they follow us docilely, and if they should dare to disobey, we punish them for their disobedience, as Melvin and R.W. punished T.J. by beating him. T.J. murdered no one. His guilt lies more in his gullibility, in his belief that two white men cared about him than at anything else. If you are asking yourselves, did the Simpsons actually pay a part in all of this, ask yourselves, why would T.J. lie about it? He is a black boy. The men of this jury are white. The man who was killed was white. Why would T.J. accuse white men of being part of the break-in that night, of being the actual murderers, when this very accusation could turn you against him? Why? Because, gentlemen, it is the truth. He searched their faces and repeated, It is the truth. Mr. Maccabee's plea to the jury demanded that they remember that the murder of a fine, upstanding citizen had been committed, and that above all else had to be the deciding factor. Not the age of the defendant, the color of his skin, or the color of the man murdered. He said that he said all that the jury heard, all that. But I didn't believe for one minute that he believed it or the jury did. But they nodded and left to cast their votes. The spectators stood and stretched. Some left the courtroom and came outside. Most stayed waiting. The boys and I joined the people on the ground and stood near the old man still sitting at the foot of the tree. None of us said anything as we avoided looking at each other, afraid our fear would be seen until Christopher John adamantly declared, But T.J. ain't killed nobody. He ain't. Stacy put his hand on Christopher John's neck and brought him near but said nothing. There was nothing to say now. 
Well, what you think of that nigga story in there? We looked around. A group of white farmers stood by ne nearby. A group of white farmers stood nearby dividing the chopped tobacco. Oh, it's just nigga talk, scoffed one of them. Like R.W. said, the nigga was lying. Yeah, well, most likely, said another. But I know it's Justice Overton to be a fine and upright man, and he wouldn't be lying on nobody deliberate. Yeah, yeah, I know that. But he was most likely just mistaken this time. Just thought he'd seen that truck. Yeah, most likely, I reckon. Stacy moved us away. Stacy, what you think, huh? I whispered. What you think? Stacy looked up at the courthouse. It's bad, Cassie. That's all I know. Stacy Logan, is that you? We turned and found Mrs. Wade Jamison standing before us. She was a plump woman in her fifties and was dressed soberly in a dark blue suit and hat. Although we saw her seldom, we had no trouble recognizing her, for she had one gray eye and one brown one, and a smile that always seemed to be tugging at her lips. Wade told me your papa said he wasn't coming for him for the trial. Where is he? Christopher John, little man, and I looked to Stacy to answer, but he didn't. He was staring at Mrs. Jameson, resentment in his face. Mo Clarence and little Willie stood to the side saying nothing. Mrs. Jameson had not addressed them. I said, where is he? She repeated when she still received no answer. She gazed down at us, suspicion in her double-colored eyes. Don't tell me he's not here. We neither confirmed nor denied this. Her expression hardened. Stacy, how'd you come? Stacy waited, the resentment still there, then said, Wagon. Who's wagon? Friends. Your folks know you're here? Stacy glared at her, showing her he felt it was no business of hers. We had to see TJ was all. And your folks think y'all at school? Lord, Lord, they must be plumb out of their minds with worry about y'all. Or at least way they will be for long. How you getting home? Same way we come. By wagon? It'll be way past this little one's bedtime by then. She put her hand out to touch little man's face. He stepped back away from her. Mrs. Jameson sighed deeply, looking at all of us, and went back into the courthouse. A few seconds later, Mr. Jameson appeared in a courtroom window and stuck out his head. Stacy, he summoned. Stacy looked up and walked over. After the verdict's in, all of you wait for me and I'll take you home. We got a way home. Not a way that'll get you there before your folks start getting worried. There's seven of us, and we got a ride with hope folks waiting on us. Mr. Jamison glanced past Stacy to Mo, Little Willie, and Clarence. He had been around their families enough to know who, he, who they were. He nodded. You can all squeeze in. Tell your friends in the wagon to go on. What about the Averys? Won't they need a ride back? They're staying in town tonight. They want to be near TJ. He started to turn away from the window. Stacy stopped him. Mr. Jameson, how much longer? Mr. Jameson looked out at the sun, low on the horizon. The longer it takes, the better. Let's hope he did not finish. Now you all wait, he said, and left the window. We did not have to wait long. In less than 30 minutes, the jury returned. The vote poll was taken. Twelve men on the jury. Twelve votes of guilty. There was no mercy. T.J. received the death penalty. Mrs. Avery screamed. The courtroom erupted in sporadic clapping. Judge Havishak ordered immediate silence, then thanked the jury members for their fine service and dismissed them. T.J., who remanded to the hands of Sheriff Dobbs to be taken at the first opportunity to the state penitentiary at Parchman. Then he stood, adjourning the court, and left. 
The white court gores spilled from the building. Mr. and Mrs. Avery, Reverend Gabson, Mr. Silas Lanier, and the others stayed seated in their tiny corner until beckoned by Mr. Jameson to come forward. T.J. still sat in the courtroom. He showed no emotion at all. Not crying, not talking. When he had stood for the verdict, he had looked as if he had not heard it since he had sat again and had not moved. Now, as his mother reached him, throwing her arms around him and crying as she had done the night he had been almost lynched, it must have hit him that he had been found guilty. For he let out a mournful yelp like a wounded animal, hunted, captured, and now about to die. We couldn't watch anymore. Little man Christopher John, Cassie, go on down, Stacy said. We obeyed him, and he followed with Mo, Little Willie, and Clarence. Yeah, just like I figured, said the old man who had sat under the tree throughout the ordeal. Trial or lynching, it always be the same. Sure is. Always the same. Mr. Jameson came out from the courthouse and over to where we were. His face was drawn and his eyes bloodshot. We can go now, he said. Mr. Jameson, said Stacy, his voice sounding hoarse. We, we want to see T.J. before we go. He paused as Mr. Jameson studied him. We got to do that. Mr. Jameson nodded toward the corner of the courthouse. They'll bring bringing him out that side door to take him back to jail. We went, Stacy, Christopher John, Little Man, Mo, Turner, Clarence Hopkins, Little Willie Wiggins, and I to the door to wait. Others waited there too, curious to see the prisoner. Shortly the door opened and Sheriff Dobbs and Deputy Sheriff Haynes came out. TJ was between them. There were irons on his ankles now, making him shuffle as he walked and his hands had been cut behind him, making him look even more like the prisoner he was. Stacy cleared his throat. <clears> throat. Hey, T.J., he said. At first there was no response from T.J. His head was lowered. His eyes saw no one. T.J., it's Stacy. We all come. Slow, slowly, T.J. raised his head. The dark eyes brightened in recognition, and for a moment the smile that had once come so easily flashed across his face, making me forget how much I had disliked this frail, frightened boy. Before any more could be said, Deputy Sheriff Haynes shoved his way through the crowd, taking T.J. with him. Looking back over his shoulder at us, T.J. smiled one last time. Then the smile and he were gone as he bowed his head and walked on. Tears stung my eyes, and he blurred before me. We were never to see T.J. again. And that is the end of chapter 3. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and grant you his peace.